The Venetian Method, Part 4. W.T. Stead and the Jesuit Rhodes Milner Round Table Group, founded 1891. Wherever I have discussed the issue of the forces that are most tangible for the creation of the United States of Europe, I have shown that two elements are needed to reach a European federation on the same path as other federations on a similar scale. Created by, dash. The first and foremost is the existence of a certain extraordinary force that is powerful enough to necessitate the unification of those whose existence is threatened by that force. In other words, to establish a kingdom of heaven, you need to have an effective devil. Where do we find a suitable devil to defeat the forces of inertia, as well as the most active elements of national rivalry and racial antipathy, and thus bring about a federation of Europe? The other element that is missing is a central power that is strong enough to force opposing states into an alliance. There is, of course, a nobler ideal that could unite free and equal states voluntarily, of their own goodwill, on the basis of complete independence. But this is not how human nature was made. There is usually an opposing minority that needs to be forced to volunteer. Almost every European state. England is no exception, represents the result of a process in which a strong central power gradually crushed all its rivals and established the authority they now recognize, either by agreement or by the final process of beheading or slaughtering those whose private and their local interests led them to refuse to cooperate in a larger unit. We should not be surprised if the European United States gains its physical existence after a major bloodshed. It is however, a matter of detail, and it is a thousand times better that people are killed to pave the way for the realm of the rule of law than to be killed by Winston Spencer Churchill from a united Europe simply to perpetuate the existing anarchy, as a condition for the creation of a world super-government, of course, we do not want a united Europe to provide a final and complete solution to all the problems of international relations. The ultimate goal we must strive for is the creation of a prestigious, omnipotent world order. Unless a certain effective world super-government emerges and becomes operational quickly, the prospects for peace and human progress remain dark and doubtful. But let's not misunderstand the main issue. Without a united Europe, the future of the world government is not guaranteed. This is an urgent and essential step towards realizing this ideal. Robert Strast's Hube, a well-known foreign policy and geostrategic opinion maker of Hungarian Jewish descent, also spoke about the post-war union of the two opposite poles, will the future world order be the American Universal Empire? This must be. The mission of the American people to bury the nation-states and lead the peoples deprived of their state into larger Union 7. The so-called Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion the principle of double deception can also be thoroughly documented in this particular writing, first introduced in 1920. At the turn of the century they were thrown into the public consciousness without a name. It is a very instructive read, it is much bigger and different in significance than is usually considered pros and cons, only the first person of the plural needs to be expanded with ruminists, the SJ-FM joint venture that is the left with his brothers, and Goth is replaced by other people, and everything falls into place. As one of Herman Bear's novels pointed out in 1916, there are three real powers, some of whose members and groups form a certain background coalition, the Freemasons, and especially the Monsignor and Rabbis. The text of the Zion Protocol is the most diabolical mixture of arousing feelings of conservatism and incitement against the true values of the modern age, which obviously cannot be attributed to the ages in general. We understand the real source of the text if we examine not the superficial message but the paradoxical intentions behind it, which it seeks to lead by arousing sympathies and antipathies. Several of the Protocol's predictions have been made ranging from the Bolshevik and Nazi projects, to the instigation of economic crises and world burns, to the establishment of the State of Israel, not to mention the British-American geopolitical interests, see Balfour Declaration, Rothschilds and the Rhodes-Milner Group and its network. 
At the same time, the draconian plans for a new world order are coming to fruition, which we are on the verge of today. The occult fraternities always announce their plans in anonymous form before or at the turn of a new century, the ingenuity and tone of which are very similar. The testament of Peter the Great at the end of the 18th century and the emperor's dream at the end of the 19th century are attached. With a poem in which truth goes to the hypnotist. Now a few quotes from the protocols of the wise men of Zion. With all the secret underground tools available to us and the gold that is entirely in our hands, we will create a universal economic crisis throwing out entire masses of workers into the streets at once in all the countries of Europe. To keep public opinion in check, we need to confuse in such a way as to voice so many conflicting views from all sorts of different sides, and until the peoples lose their heads in this maze and are convinced that it is best to man has no view at all on political matters which the public cannot understand anyway because it is understood only by those who control the public. That's the first secret. If one wants to achieve a serious goal, one should not shy away from any means and not count those who have to be sacrificed for the sake of the goal. We did not count the victims of the offspring of the bastard peoples, of course we had to sacrifice many of ours, but at the cost of that we have already given ours a situation on earth that they could not have even dreamed of. I am, p. 95. Carol Quigley of the Rhodes Milner Roar Roundtable Group. There has been and has existed for generations an international Anglophile network that, in a sense, works the way the far right views the work of the communists. This network, which we can identify with the roundtable groups, really has no aversion to cooperating with the communists or any other group, and often does. I know the workings of this network because I studied for 20 years and in the 60s I was allowed two years to inspect their records and secret records. I have no aversion to them or to most of their assets. I objected to some of their political intentions, both in the past and in the present. But in general, the main difference between myself and my group is that they want to remain unknown, while I believe they have played a significant enough role in history to be known become. Anthony Sutton on the principle of opposition to the operation of Skull and Bones, an American secret society that is an integral part of the Anglophile network. Relationships can be found between some international bankers in New York and many revolutionaries, including the Bolsheviks. These bankers, whom we identified, were financially interested in the success of the Bolshevik Revolution. Investment in Nazi Germany along with similar investments in the Soviet Union, reflected higher political intentions, much more than direct profit-making, although profit-making cannot be ignored. In order to find out these higher political intentions, it is necessary to penetrate the financial control system of multinational companies, because those who control the flow of money ultimately control the day-to-day -day politics. Zbigniew Brzezinski on how to create effective American and international cooperation. As America becomes an increasingly multicultural society, it is becoming increasingly difficult to find consensus on foreign policy matters except in the face of a truly serious, widespread, external threat. Lectures by C.G. Harrison at the Anglo-Catholic Berean Society, 1893. Take today's Europe as an example. With the exception of the Slavic peoples, which we will talk about below, and with the exception of a small Turanian element that is too insignificant to deal with, this is a similar wording for Hungarians as the desert on the 1890 map of Russia, the nations of modern Europe, and their American and colonial branches represent the fifth subspecies, cultural era, of the great Aryan root race. In the days of the Roman Empire, these nations lived their infancy. Prior to the Roman conquest, Gaul, Britain, and Germany were not nations but existed only at the tribal level. Their conquest and their division into the Roman Empire marked the phase of infancy. Roman law was their educator and protector. The educator was followed by the teacher. The collapse of the Roman Empire and the rise of the papacy marked the stage of childhood 
or the beginning of the unfolding of the intellect. The age of youth, with a wider interest and increased imagination, began with the Renaissance and ended with the Reformation. The masculinity of modern Europe dates back to the 16th century. Consider the Slavic peoples who belonged to the Sixth Aryan subspecies, ca. 2380 to 4540. What do we find? Russia, a powerful empire that unites countless local communities under a despotic rule. Poland, the remnant of a kingdom whose only cohesive force is its religion, and which is nevertheless eventually reintegrated into the Russian Empire. There are still many tribes here who, under the oppression of a foreign Turkey, have taken the yoke off and artificially consolidated into small state formations whose independence will last until the next great European war breaks out. What is the characteristic of this subspecies, Slavs, Russians, in its infancy? Western Europeans are used to talking about their barbarism, and to some degree they are right. Their destiny is to develop their higher civilization from themselves in the future. The Russian Empire must die so that the Russian people can live, and the realization of the dreams of the pan-slavists will indicate that the sixth Aryan subspecies has begun to live its own spiritual life and is no longer in its infancy. There is no need to go into further detail. We can say that the national character enables them to carry out the experiments of political and economic socialism, which would present innumerable difficulties in Western Europe at present. The well-informed Harrison called one of the main groups of secret societies the Left Brothers, including the Jesuits, who, as a state within a state, guard the ghost and shadow of ancient Rome, seeking to save it, essentially against the living impulse of Christ. In the 20th century, they moved the threads behind the Bolsheviks and Nazis to create the EU on the ruins, the lobby of the world government, as Churchill alluded to. End of reading